My name's Guy Feltman, for those of you who, we have, if we haven't met yet, one of the elders here. Um, just to let you know, Peter is officially, as from the first of this month, is on staff here at the church. Uh, him and his wife, Jamie, have taken over the youth from Brook and Sasunda. Brook and Sasunda, please stand. That's an amazing couple. They really have taken our youth on, and they feel that their season is changing somewhat. They're still going to stay on our leadership team, but they do feel that they're just trying to figure out what God's saying um, in terms of where they should be putting their energy. There's some exciting thoughts around that. So they're handing over to Peter and Jamie. Peter's coming on to staff, or is on staff. Um, we just feel that youth need place in the church, don't they? It doesn't mean that the elderly don't have a place in the church. I, I, I'm over 50, so I consider myself not old by no means, but uh, I'm definitely not a youth. And so the reality is, as much as God loves to work in old, He also loves to work in young. And we feel that it demands a post, um, and so that's why Pete is going to be doing that. He goes into his first school in two weeks' time. We just feel that that should be part of his portfolio is to get into the schools, get the gospel out there. Uh, if you have access into a school, if you're a teacher and are looking for a strong young man of God to come in, there's your man. Just go chat to him. Book him in. There we go. <clears throat> just to um, not repeat the announcements, but just to endorse those two conferences the Women's Conference and then the Healing Conference for Healing Weekend this week. You might say, guys, so much is going. There's Alpha, there's this, there's, it's a public holiday, it's just crazy. Um, we didn't do that to try and make you busy. We did it because we honestly feel when we planned the year, the end of last year, we honestly felt that this is something of the direction that God is taking us in. Maureen LaRue, who will be talking to the ladies on Wednesday, uh, Cheryl and I and Ian and Bernie know her really well, her and her husband, Kenny. She's got a fascinating ministry. Not only does she speak well and with authority and power for ladies, but she has this wonderful ability, gifting, I guess, to help with the interpreting of dreams. I don't know too many other people like that, but um, she, just, she, she actually teaches on it from the Scriptures, just give handles on how to interpret dreams. And I don't know, if, I don't think she's going to be necessarily touching on that, but I just want to let you know something of uh, the gifting that she carries. And she even says when she goes into churches, if people have just had these really confusing dreams, you know it's a reoccurring dream and God is, you know it's God, but you don't know how to do it. You can have a little word with her. Don't keep her forever and ever because um, I'm sure others will want to as well. But just even if you jot it on a piece of paper and she can... I'm giving her lots of work. She's going to kick me for that, but it doesn't matter. Um, that's Wednesday. And then Friday and Saturday, the healing weekend. There's something about giving God time, especially around the subject of healing. We need to see some breakthroughs in healing, don't we? I remember we ran one in, in Belito. We had a healing conference. And... There's something about people coming with, that, with, a, with a common purpose. There's faith in the room for miracles. And one of our elders, Charles, had tripped um, in training for the comrades, and he couldn't lift his arm higher than that. And in worship at the healing conference, he found his arm up here. No one touched him, just in worship. And he looked around, he came to me, he said, Guy, I have never been able to do this before. I'm suddenly healed, no one touched him. A lady walked through the door, feeling terribly sick, as someone greeted her at the door, she literally was healed. No one, no one prayed for her. There's something about faith levels that rise when you give God time at a concentrated weekend like that. So, busy time, but I invite you to come. You'll miss out if you don't. That's uh, Friday and Saturday. This morning, we are bringing on 20 new deacons. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> it's very exciting. We're super stoked about that, and I actually want to talk to you just briefly about deacons. I want to give, if I could say it, I want to give the theology of deacons. My observation has been that often people can be in church for years and years and years, and we as elders just assume that everyone kind of knows how it works, 
But if we don't teach on it, it's no wonder why some people have no idea what do elders do, what do deacons do, who are the elders in the church, who are the deacons. So I want to just um, do that for a little while, then Ian's going to take over from me, and we're going to call deacons up and um, bring them into office. Isn't that exciting? So the word deacon is actually found five times in the New Testament. Three of those times are in three different chapters, and I want to open those chapters up to you. Um, if you can turn there with me, just so you can see from the Scripture that God actually, it's God's idea to have deacons, not ours. So turn with me to Philippians 1, please. If you knew yet, if you're from Alpha, by the way, and this is your first time in church, or first time to this church, just a really hearty, warm welcome to you. Um, if, you're not, if anyone is not sure of their way around the Bible, just go to the front of your Bible, look in the index, and you'll see where the, the, the book is that I'm going to be mentioning. So Philippians is the first one in the New Testament. Chapter 1, verses 1. This is Paul speaking to the church in Philippi, and he says this, To all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, who, who does that, who's that, who's all? In this context, that's every believer. He's saying to all of those in the church. Another version says to all the saints. Who's a saint? We're all saints. Everyone who's a Christian or a follower of Jesus is a saint. So he says to all the saints or God's people at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons. Overseers is actually another word for elder or pastor. They're all the same thing. So he's saying to the saints, which is everyone, to the deacons and to the elders. And then he gives us instruction in the rest of the book. And there we have the first record, or when I say first, in, in, um, in the context of the preach this morning, of the word deacons. Secondly, 1 Timothy 3, verse 8 to 13, if you can turn there. This is where Paul actually now gives an overview of the qualifications of deacons, what deacons should actually do. And those that are coming on this morning, just a reminder, this is pretty much what um, the Scripture says and what we assume is part of your life. I'll read from verse 8. In the same way, deacons, there's the word deacons again, are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, if you know any of these deacons that are getting drunk on the sideline, please let us know, because that's a disqualification right there. And not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested. And if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. There's the word deacons again. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. It's beautifully packaged. The first seven verses of that chapter, Paul talks about the qualifications of elders, and now he goes on to the qualifications of deacons. And as we have been praying as elders and discussing with the guys that are coming on today, we trust that these things are evident in their lives. It doesn't mean perfection. No one's perfect, only Jesus. But it does mean to the best of our ability to hold to these truths. And then the third um, part of the scriptures where it speaks about deacons is in Romans 16 and verse 1. If you're turning there, you can go there now, Romans 16:1. Paul talks to a specific, or talks about a specific lady, her name is Phoebe, great name if any of you are looking for a name for a child, Phoebe. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Centuria. By the way, if your name is Phoebe, it's wonderful, I'm just, I suddenly thought maybe there is someone here whose name is Phoebe. <laughs> bless you, bless you, bless you. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon 
of the church in Centuria. Some versions use the word servant there. And if you actually look at what that word servant means in the Greek, it's diakonos, which is also deacon. So those words are interchangeable, servant, deacon. And that's the reason we are comfortable with bringing ladies onto our team because of that scripture. So that's a bit of a package of what the scripture talks about when it, when it speaks about deacons. There is another um, section of scriptures as well, a couple of verses in Acts chapter 6. And again, just because of the sake, for the sake of time, I won't go through them. But quick summary, in this church in the New Testament, there was all sorts of life. There was growth that was happening. And there, there came this problem between, between two groups of people. It was the Greeks and the Hebrews, the widows among them. It seemed like there was a little bit of tension. And some of the... Um, Greeks were thinking that they were being overlooked in the distribution of food. There was obviously some ministry that was happening in the church. And in some ways, it felt almost like a bit of racism, like this group of people saying, well, you guys seem to be getting preferential treatment. And so the apostles got together and said, we've got to solve this problem. But it's not for the elders to do or the apostles to do because they need to devote themselves to the Word of God and to prayer. Let's choose seven people who are full of wisdom full of the Holy Spirit and hand this responsibility over to them so that they can sort out some of these realities. Now scholars, will, most scholars agree that although it doesn't mention the word deacons, they seem to be implying that that was something of the role of deacons, that those were deacons who were appointed. And the amazing thing was once they were released to go and help sort out of these, some of these challenges, peace seemed to come back into that church. And it's fascinating, at the end, um, if you look at verse, well, don't, you don't have to turn there, but at the, at the end of that story in verse 7, the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. When deacons are brought on, when leaders are brought on, that's something of what happens. God can bring increase due to order. We are finding ourselves in a situation this morning where this church is growing and we're extremely grateful for it. We don't sit as elders and plan and say, okay, let's throw out a figure. We're going to throw out, let's say, 700. We want seven new, 700 new people to join this church by the end of the year. Some people do that. We just don't have the conviction to do that. What we feel to do is to say, Lord, whoever you sending to this church we want to do well in serving them. And it just seems at the moment that numbers and numbers of people are coming in. I mean, look this morning. It's, this place is nearly full. So we're delighted, but we want to do well in pleasing God and in serving this church well. And so that's the reason that we're bringing a bunch on this morning and there were some that couldn't make this this particular training we want to do another one soon as well so what I want to try and do is answer three questions before we pray for these deacons this morning why the title like why why call people deacons why give them a title secondly why now in CU and thirdly why deacons so let's look at each of those number one why the title some people have said to me, Guy, I'm functioning as a deacon. I don't need hands laid on me. I don't need the title. I don't want the title. I'm happy to just carry on on the sidelines and just do it without anyone knowing. It's a noble thought, and it's a, it's a humble heart that says that. But the Bible doesn't seem to agree with that statement. And we've just read there in those three portions, and I've hinted on the fourth one as well in Acts 6, that without deacons, the church doesn't function properly. Let me explain that to you now. Let's say you go to hospital. You want to know who the nursing staff are. You want to know who the doctors are. You want to know who's doing what. Imagine if a hospital just ran randomly. Like, okay, whoever's around on that day, just make sure that the patients are looked after. Um, if you're battling with a certain operation, call someone else in and they can, you know, even if you haven't been trained, give it a bash. If it goes wrong, call someone else. It's just chaos. It's silly. 
Everyone knows what their function is. And so does in the church. What about a young person in matric, the beginning of the year or the end of the previous year, they get selected to be a prefect. Leadership in God's kingdom is not about hierarchy. Even our government, when our government operates biblically, the government should be there to protect people, not to lord it over them. So this prefect comes on. If they are proud and arrogant, it will go to their heads, but a good prefect will function in such a way as they see their leadership gift there to help and to support and to serve those around them. You need leaders. What about a qualified mechanic? I was saying in the first service, um, just to point someone out here, Vainant has recently just been promoted um, to a, a, actually a really wonderful job as a mechanic. Well done, Bud. So proud of you. But imagine taking your car in and you don't quite know who does what. and You hope that someone's going to fix it for you. You're not quite sure of their qualifications. I mean, that trip, that trip to Joburg the week after you get your car back is quite daunting. Did they do the job properly? Because no one really knew what they were doing. What about a, a woman who becomes a mom? She might say, I don't want the, function, I don't want the title of a mom. I've got news for you, ma'am. You are. On Wednesday, you were just a normal lady. On Thursday, you had a baby. Your life has changed. You have a baby. Did I say your life has changed? Your life changes when you become a mom. It's a, tight, it's a function. It's not a title. The emphasis is not so much on now, now I'm a mom. No, you have the privilege of looking after a child. That's the emphasis is on what you do. The emphasis is on the function. Even Paul himself in the scriptures occasionally would say, I, Paul, I nearly said a mechanic, I, Paul, <laughs> an apostle. He called himself what he was. He knew his gifting. He knew God had called him from heaven to be an apostle because his function was desperately needed in that context to plant churches and to see these churches nourished and to get other guys who could help with this wonderful gospel. The problem comes in if Paul had to say, I, Apostle Paul, dot, dot, dot. Because then he's promoting his title. But he didn't promote his title. He said, I, Paul. And then he highlighted his function, an apostle. It would be like Craig. Craig is an elder in this church, or Rich is an elder, or Eugene's an elder, or whoever. For me, the problem lies when, when we make a big deal about the title. If I called Craig Pastor Craig all the time, I would have a problem with that. Because although he is a pastor, he is an elder, that doesn't need to be emphasized. His title does not need to be emphasized. What needs to be emphasized is what he does. God puts elders in churches to bring government, to bring shepherding, to bring nurturing, to take God's heart, to find God's heart, and to implement that into the local church. So we're not highlighting someone's title when they become leaders in the church. We're highlighting their function. And it's okay to do that because without that function, things would not work well. Does that make sense? Does it? Actually, when someone becomes a deacon, it's an office. It's like something happens to them. I can't describe it, but when I became an elder, although I was functioning as an elder before that, when I got prayed for, something changed. Everything was the same naturally, but spiritually something changed. It felt like this blanket rested on my shoulders. That's the best way I can describe it. It felt like it, it's, it was like this, I want to use the word weight, like a heaviness. Not a bad heaviness, but it was, it was different. I felt that I had more authority when I spoke to people. I felt that there was, in terms of how, how God wanted to use me, there just seemed to be an increase of His anointing on my life, just through someone laying hands upon me. And that's why at the end of the service we're calling these deacons up. It's not to promote them. In fact, if we had to promote them to anything, it would be to promote them to servanthood. Because remember, we read that scripture in Romans 16.1. 
Phoebe, a servant of the Lord or a deacon of the Lord. Those words servant and deacon are used interchangeably. Diakonos, servant or deacon. But there is something of an impartation that happens when God brings deacons on. That's to answer the, quest, the first question, why the title? The second question, why now? Why now in CU? So much is happening. I mean, if you are part of the Alpha, I was here on, on Thursday night and just stood at the back there, just marveling at the life that's in this place. There's over 200 people that are doing the Alpha at the moment. Almost every space in this hall is taken by big tables. If you walk up the stairs, there's life because the youth are up there having their, and Ellie said pizzas. The children are having pizzas in the tent. The youth are eating what we all eat. There's just life. Everyone's doing something. Everyone's, there's growth and there's life, and our friends are here. And now we're bringing deacons on in the midst of that. Well, the very reason we're bringing deacons on is because God's adding to the church. And like I said earlier, we don't try and scheme and make that happen and have these charts of how many, how many X amount of people we want to join the church at the same time. We don't do that. We just say, thank you, Lord, and we want to do well in serving you. I mean, we've got these dreams and the plans are already out there. Most of you know that I'm putting a new building at the bottom um, to cater for the growth. I was walking around on Thursday night. I parked my car at the bottom there. And the parking lot was almost full. Well, I'm sure we could have fitted more in. But God's bringing growth. And He sees fit to sustain the growth through bringing on new leaders. Deacons and elders, new elders and deacons that are brought on, sustain the growth and create space for more growth. Do you know that a big church is not bad. Some Christians have got this big thing about big church. Like, no, big church is from the devil. These mega churches, not into them. I understand the caution behind that. But if you were a Christian 2,000 years ago, at the birthing of the church, you would have been in a big church. Because Pentecost, when God poured out His Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the church was birthed with how many people? 3,000. The, the, the first church had 3,000 people in. Actually bigger because it seemed to be more than that. And then shortly after that, a whole bunch more people came to Christ and then it was 5,000 and it just kept growing. What sustains the big is the small. The problem comes in when a church grows and there's not these smaller groups that can sustain the life, that can look after people. Does that make sense? Which is the main, most of our deacons in this church are small group leaders, life group leaders. And we want them to be because we want everyone in this church to be known well by someone. Five sets of elders or six sets of elders, we, we, can't, we can't look after everyone. And that's not the goal. The goal is not for elders to, otherwise we... We're promoting ourselves for us to be involved in every detail. We, we don't need to do that. But we want everyone to be looked after by someone. We want people to know how you're doing, how your children are doing if you've got kids. If you're in a relationship, young guys, how's your relationship going? We want to, you to be able to talk to guys about it. A crisis hits your family. We want to know about that. And that's the beauty of this, this dynamic team of deacons is that as the church is growing, everyone can be known by someone. That's why it's so important to belong to a small group. So why now and see you? Firstly, because it sustains the growth. Secondly, it ensures that ministries are healthy. There are many ministries in this church. I don't know if you know that. There's lots and lots and lots of different ministries. And as these deacons come through, it, they can just get more and more and more. The reason ministries exist is so that the church can be strong and healthy. I want to say that our, our, these, these new 
guys or this new crop that are coming through have been trained. Um, we spent a little bit of time with them some time back. We just had, it was a short training, but um, our deacons meetings that run once a month, we continue with training, so it's ongoing. That's why we haven't you know, done months and months and months of training. But we've spoken th- these heart things through. We've spoken about logistics, but also about heart. And I've said to all of them, if there's something that you think would disqualify you from being a leader in this church, please let us know. And some have come and just said, look, I actually feel now might not be the right time. Or they're coming on, but they, they've spoken about some things, some skeletons in the cupboard from the past that have needed to be discussed. I want to be able to say, if someone comes onto our deacon team, And an outsider comes and says, do you know what that person did five years ago? I want to be able to say, yeah, I actually do know. They've said that. And it's past and it's over and it's under the blood of Jesus and it's all taken care of. And so we've had these these, um, heart discussions and I can say with confidence as elders that we're bringing them on. We also want young people to come on. And I'm happy to say today that we've got a number of youngsters that are coming on. Church is not only for the elderly. And when I say elderly, <laughs> I'm not going to put an age in there. You are the wise. There we go. I mean, honestly, the average church today takes care of people in their 30s, 40s plus. But I'm saying, why wait till you're 30 before you can count for God? We've always said we want 13, 14, 15-year-olds to be on the deacon team. Why not? you look at how young Jesus' team was, if someone's mature in God and can lead and influence others around them, there's no reason that young people can't be on the deacon team at a young age. Finally, why deacons? Why? Because the Bible endorses it. And I trust you've seen that from what we've spoken about. It's God's idea, not ours. God sees fit. As we went through those scriptures, God sees fit to bring elders, deacons, and saints into the local church. Secondly, it works. It just does. When you bring leaders in and you continue to add to the leadership team, it brings order in a church, it brings smooth running, and it brings security. If you look at just the way the coffees work here and all sorts of other ministries, it requires behind-the-scenes stuff, and a lot, of, a lot of deacons pull together teams around them to make this thing happen. It enables the church to continue to be dynamic. And let me end by saying this. The church is God's idea. The elders are not the head of a church. Jesus is the head of his church. The elders don't lord it over people. I've got no right to go to anyone and say, you must do this and you must do that. The heart of the elder, elders and deacons, is to take the word of God and to bring it before the people in a way that they want the truth and they want to grow from truth and they want to develop in their walk with God. It's his church. He's the elder, the lead elder, ultimately. He's the one who's the visionary. When we go away twice a year as elders and we plan and we discuss, which we're going to do in, when are we going? October, November this year, to plan for 2024. We're trying to hear God. What are you saying, Lord? Where are you taking the church? What are you doing not only in White River, but what are you doing through this church in other nations? What nations should we explore next year? It's His church. He's the chief. He's the king. Our job is to hear what King Jesus is saying get behind it, and we run with all of our might. And I'm happy to say in this church, I think that's happening. When friends come from outside and they visit, often they'll say things like, it just works, this thing just works. And I'll say, you know what the strangest thing is? I don't know half of what's going on in this church. If you come and ask me for details, I just want to say up front, you're probably asking the wrong guy because I try and keep out of details because we've got such a dynamic team. They make it happen. I don't want to know details because then it distracts me from what I should be called to do, which is ministry of the word, prayer, and being with people. I want to have coffees with people and minister to people and like pull, pull out of you what God's saying and see you fly. 
And honestly, that's what the deacons do. They're involved in logistics. Not only, but very often they they what makes this stuff all happen. Having said that, I don't want to reduce their function to logistics. Because when you look at Acts 6, the guys that were chosen to be deacons were, I mean, they were powerful. Evangelists and strong, strong men who just had this intimate relationship with God, full of the Spirit, full of wisdom. I'm not talking about a perfect team. I'm just talking about a team that passionately loves Jesus. And I worship this morning for me. I mean, Ian, I don't know how you were able to close that meeting off. It was, it was, it must have been tough because God was just so richly here, wasn't he? That's what we live for. It's not a, it's not a structure. It's not an organization. It's dynamic. It's organic. Sometimes as elders, we should sit up front not knowing what to do. Because God's in this place. I think we had a taste of that this morning. You know? Order says you've got to start at this time, which I agree with, starting on time, and it's got to run like this, and, and it must end like this. And Sometimes you've just got to let it all go and say, Lord, this is way beyond us. This is way beyond us. And he was doing that this morning, just touching some of you so deeply. His church is not ours. And as these guys come on this morning, they're coming on to get on board with what he's doing. So let me pray. Sorry, when I use the word guys, you understand it means men and women. In case I confuse you. Yes, guy. <laughs> Clever boy. Lord, it's just so amazing to be part of the church. We live for you, Lord. We live for your world and your instructions. We say today, you tell us what to do, Lord, and we'll do it. We don't want to tell you what to do. We don't want to put you in a box. You're the king. You're the captain of the church. And you're coming back for a bride that is beautiful, no blemishes, no spots, just wanting to please God. Lord, I just think of your last moments on that cross. Where part of the reason you died was for the church, Lord. You said in Ephesians 5 to husbands, Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You died for the church, Lord. What we're experiencing now, you had this in your mind. You died for her. To think that every church in every town and every village and every nation you died for that church. We're just so grateful. Lord, I just want to say we bless every other church in our community. We don't see ourselves as the big church, the main church, the only church, the church that's going to solve all the problems. We see our church as a small part of a massive picture. May we do well, Lord, in glorifying you. May we do well in serving White River. May people know if they want to go to a church, there's several to choose from. Maybe we be May we be one of those. We, we make it easy for people to come and to experience Christ. Lord, may we reflect you well. May we be known as a people that are led by the Holy Spirit, that keep in step with the Holy Spirit, that give up our programs for your program. It's a special day, Lord as we bring these men and women on. And I just, we don't have to ask you, we want to thank you. May the church grow and benefit from this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, God. Indeed, we had a taste of heaven this morning. And it's just wonderful to be um, setting into office these new deacons, what we're going to do is just read out the names of the current deacons and then invite those to come out here. And then for the new deacons to invite you to come out and then we're going to pray over you and lay hands over you. Just thinking about it this morning, we're going to be praying over the parents, 
but uh, it's because it's a function, the whole family are involved in a sense. And so if you have your children here, you're welcome to bring your children up together with you as we lay hands on these people. So let me just read out the names of the, the current deacons in the church, and then I'm going to invite you to come out uh, to the front here first. Let me just get my fair cakes first. Uh, Chris and Erica Ferreira, Deirdre, Eric and Joe, Glenda, Ian and Sue, Lucinda, and Susanda and Brooke. These are our current standing deacons at the moment. And then we're going to invite the new ones to come up, which is Andre and Izette. Andre and Izette. If I may just point out at the moment that today is Andre's 60th birthday as well. Congratulations, Andre. Another 60 to go, my boy. Anton and Faith, Damon and Sandra, Dylan, uh, Ivan, Ingrid, Isabel, MC and Francella, Peter and Jamie, Raphael, Van Vyk and Anin, Willy and Ricky, and Vaynant. These are the new guys. So maybe if the new guys can stand in front of the, the existing guys, and then the elders are going to come out, and I'm going to ask, hand it over to Guy again just to pray over them. And uh, as elders, we're going to lay hands on them as well. So the, the current, current deacons at the back, the, the new, newbies in the front, and the elders, you want to come and pray for them. <clears throat> Side, yeah. Eh? Shouldn't you guys be there? You <laughs> See, sorry. I clearly wasn't listening. <laughs> I don't always listen in church. I'm just confessing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, Lord, this is amazing. Sure. So I want to ask the new deacons this question. Maybe, maybe one or two questions. We know you're not perfect, but will you do your best to love these amazing people, to serve them, even when it's uncomfortable, um, even if they offend you, that you won't spread a rumor before you do it the biblical way. If someone offends you, that you'll go to them and do it the Bible way. Is there a yes to that question? Good. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> Do you take this woman as your wedding? <laughs> and then the second question is, will you do your best before the Lord to stay soft-hearted and thick-skinned? And to please Him before you please anyone else. If ever as leaders we get cross with the sheep, it's not the sheep's problem, it's our problem. And will you do your best to keep short accounts and keep close to the Lord in the way you lead them. Will you? Amen. I do. <laughs> and to the church, will you do your best to just get alongside these guys, to make it a delight for them to lead? Will you? Yeah, boy. If any of us up here hurt you, for those of you that are there, will you, will you commit to making right? Not spreading rumors, not even husbands and wives if you're married here, not even going home and saying, God ignored me again. If you do that, it's wrong. Let me just say it as it is, it's wrong. The Bible gives no room for spreading offense. Even before you tell your spouse, if you can't work that thing through, the Bible way is Matthew 18. You pick up that phone or you send a WhatsApp. I don't even mind WhatsApps and say, God, can we have a coffee? And then just talk and just say, God, I'm, just, I'm battling. It just seems like every time you walk past me, you ignore me. Have I done something to, you know, to annoy you? That's the way we keep peace in God's church is we talk about stuff. These guys are not, although we are busy, we're not too busy to be with people. 
I always say, I get paid to be with people. I get paid to have coffees. I've paid to do life as a shepherd with, with people. And that's part of the role that these guys are accepting the responsibility of, of, of doing life with you. Amen. Let's set them apart now. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord.